Greetings to all of you gathered by the end of June, perhaps in your worship spaces again, but more likely gathered in, your worship, in, your, in the worship space in your living room or in your dining room. So unusual for us, so not normal. And yet, in the middle of this COVID crisis, we have learned how to do things we didn't know before. We have we've learned how to do things differently and feel like it's kind of a new normal. I wonder if any of us expect, expected our churches to respond that way, to respond so quickly to such a fast change in the world, to such a bewildering change in the world. I've been so impressed with how our churches have done that, how they have figured out how to care for one another, how to, to worship at a distance. Uh, it's amazing what we've done. We used to sing the song, right? The church is not a building, it's the people. I don't know if we ever quite believed it. But in this time, without our buildings, we've recognized that we can be a community without our building. And that's kind of an amazing learning in the middle of all this. We are the people gathered around Jesus. The text this week is the word of Jesus to such a people, to a people that don't have a building. They are the people who walk with Jesus, who wander with Jesus in Galilee. I'd like to center on that text with you. I'd invite you, if you are sitting somewhere where you can, can access a Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 10. That's what we'll be looking at together uh, this morning. I'd invite you to first walk with me through the narrative of the gospel very broadly, and then to focus on Matthew chapter 10. After that, I'd like to pause with you for a moment to listen to what God is saying to us today. And then I'll close. But first, join with me in a word of prayer. May these words of my mouth and the meditations and imaginations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. So we've been following Matthew's gospel this year, since late November last year. Each of the Gospels, of course, tells the story of Jesus a bit differently. They are like portraits, and portraits aren't like a photograph. The portrait highlights some things and de-emphasizes some things. The Gospel of Matthew has often been called the Gospel of the Church. It's the Gospel where Jesus directly says, You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. I will build my church. Not a building, but something more priceless a church, an ecclesia, a community, a movement. Already by chapter 4 in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus has begun, has begun to call this church together. He is walked by the seashore, you, she, the seashore, you remember, and he saw some fishermen. And he called them to follow him, to be part of his church. He called Pete the fisherman, you know, Peter wore a muscle shirt and had a tattoo of a girlfriend he once loved on his shoulder, you know. It seemed like a good idea at the time. And James and John and Andrew, fishermen. Later he would call Thomas the thinker and Martha the caterer and Mary the listener and Simon the zealot with uh, the, the mohawk standing straight out of his, off his head with a black leather jacket that says Black Lives Matter printed in block letters across the back. This radical Simon the zealot. He gathered, Jesus gathered all kinds of people into this church that he was building. So early in the gospel, early in the narrative of Matthew, Jesus gathers them together, this church he was building, gathers them on a hill. And on the hill, you remember what he said. How blessed are the poor. How blessed are the merciful. How blessed are the peacemakers. And in the sermon, he turned to the little church gathered round him and he said, you are the light of the world. You, church, will bring light wherever you live. You are the salt of the earth. You will bring the best out of the world in which you live. You know, they must have looked at each other at that moment and gone, you mean me? You mean her? You mean him? For several chapters, Jesus would continue to teach them. You have heard it said, love your friends, hate your enemies. I say to you, pray for your enemies. And then he would teach them to pray like this, our Father in heaven. 
And then this church would follow him as he brought, as people came to him that no one else even noticed. Or if they noticed them, they would walk away from them. And Jesus didn't. Throughout the journey in Galilee, this church that Jesus gathered would watch and listen. Our text today is in chapter 10, about halfway through the one year of Jesus' ministry in Galilee. Jesus now sends the church out, not to learn just by watching and by listening, but he sends them out to learn by doing. But it's a hard chapter if you look through Matthew 10. And we've been looking at it through the lectionary in the last few weeks. He begins his instructions to his church who goes out by saying, go only to the lost sheep of Israel. Stay away from the Samaritans. Stay away from those. While that might have sounded about right for the people that followed him then, it became a difficult text for the church of the Acts of the Apostles. So during that time, they said, if the gospel is only for the Jews, then why is the Spirit calling Gentiles into this church? And the church would need to learn new ways. It still does. And then Jesus instructed the church. He said, as you go, proclaim the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. Proclaim that the dream of God is close at hand. Proclaim it. You're not selling it. You're not saying, you know, if you only follow Jesus the way we do, then God will love you. No, you're proclaiming it. You are saying, church, the dream of God is at hand. You are saying, God so loved the world. Not selling anything. And then Jesus gave specific directions. He said, cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. He is telling them to do the exact things that they have watched him do in the first chapters of the narrative. Simply, he's telling them, follow me. Use everything you are and everything you aren't to follow me. You are called to heal and bless the world with everything that you are and everything you're not and everything you're not yet. Then Jesus in chapter 10 tells of what is just ahead. He says, when you go into a town, those who welcome you, give them your peace. Then he said, when they don't receive you, when they won't listen to you, then move along. It's not going to be easy, is it? He says, look, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. It's not a walk in the park. And then Jesus speaks with eyes looking far into the future. And he says, be prepared. Be prepared for being brought to trial for following me. Be prepared for being whipped in public for following me. Be prepared that families will, divide it, will be divided over me. Be prepared, he said, for this. You will be universally hated on account of my name. There will be trouble ahead. You have to wonder what his church thought at that moment, sent out into that kind of future, where the difficulty would be huge. And then to the little group of fishermen and tax collectors and academics and radicals, broken human beings, perhaps, perhaps a bit wide-eyed at what the journey ahead might include, he said this. First he said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of anyone. They can only hurt your body. They can't hurt your soul, that part of you that is you, deep, deep down. And then he said, can you buy two sparrows for a penny? Yet not one of those falls to the ground without your father who loves you knowing about it. Don't be afraid. And then he said, anyone who welcomes you welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Then he said, if anyone gives so much as a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he's a disciple, then in truth I tell you, he will most certainly not go without his reward. If anyone gives so much as a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he's a disciple, he will certainly not go without his reward. Then he sends him out, his church, to heal and to bless to be listened to and not be listened to. And he still does. I 
I invite you to step back from the narrative for a moment with me. What's it all about? The trials of this little church are so daunting, they had to wonder if they were up to it in the days to come. And it didn't stop there. In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus would say, the trouble isn't only outside the church. He would say, when a member of the church sins against you, not if, but when, when a member of the church sins against you, then go to him and humbly state your case. A chapter about dealing with the struggles inside the little band of, of the church, as well as the struggles from the outside. But I hear in Matthew 10, one word for the church in this day. That the church, this gathering of followers of Jesus, by all its names, in all its complexity, with all its difficulties, is dear to God's house. Sorry, is dear to God's heart. Jesus says to this church, don't be afraid of the powers of the world, not of war, not of violence, not of death itself. Jesus also talks about the cup of cold water. Usually it's a text that we use, especially to say that we should show hospitality, that we should give a cup of water to people. But that's not really its emphasis. Jesus says, if anyone gives so much as a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, to one of these little ones in his church, that person will not go without his reward. This church, this little gathering of followers of Jesus is loved by God. So loved by God that even a cup of water given to the least and the last and the littlest of this band will bring a blessing to the giver. Isn't that something? So this word in closing. The church is not a building. The church is a community, a movement. It is a church, a community, a movement, beloved by Jesus, beloved by God. So people of God, love this church. Love this gathering of people who follow Jesus with you. Love it not because it's perfect, not because the people are perfect, not because the bishops are perfect, not because the pastors are perfect, not because the community always gets it right. Love it because God loves it. And love the church because Jesus loves it. Love it in all of its strength, in all of its frailty. Love it in all the ways you can love a church. Show up for worship, whether it's in person or, or on some Zoom call somewhere. Support the church with your time and with your, the gifts you have to give. Pray for its bishops and its pastors and leaders and give one cup of cold water to one of the least, the lost, and the littlest. It's amazing, isn't it? We are part of a community, a movement, a church that Jesus came to build. How cool is that? Amen.